Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in Winning Cures Everything. It is the Tuesday, August 9th edition of the show, and it is the last college football division preview that I will have for this season. So we are finally to where we are going to do the SEC East. That's right, Georgia all the way through Vanderbilt, and it should be entertaining. So let me go ahead and tell you to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you would so kindly, share out the show, of course, tell all your friends about it, and make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast. Coming up this season, we will have some stuff on the podcast that is not available on YouTube. Just uh, tossing it out there. Just saying. So go ahead and knock that out if you would so kindly. Uh, let's go ahead and make sure that we dive into this. Now, the SEC East last year produced the college football national championship winner. That was the Georgia Bulldogs, and that is where we will start things off today. We're going to try and make this a not super long one. So, the Georgia Bulldogs last year, 14-1, and one, their only loss in the SEC championship game. Uh, against the spread, were ten and five last year. Their post game win expectancy for the regular season, uh, including the SEC championship game, of course, was eleven point nine eight and one point oh two. That one loss, of course, to Alabama in the SEC championship game. So the numbers do make sense. They dominated everybody all the way to the title game. So uh, looking at their projected SP plus record, it sits about ten and two. And it maybe kind of makes sense considering all of the pieces that they lost. They lost Nakobe Dean, Jamari Sailor, uh, uh, Jordan Davis, uh, White and Cook, the two running backs. Wide receiver Jermaine Burton, of course, transferred over to Alabama. But look at these numbers. PPA margin, number one. Offensive PPA per drive was number 12. Like, incredibly efficient offense for as much as everybody wanted to make fun of it. Uh, under Stetson Bennett, they they got things rolling, and they were incredibly efficient, incredibly good, uh, rather explosive. Uh, you know, it says number 80 in explosive play rate, but they were beating teams so badly that they didn't have to worry with that too much. I mean, it was just absurd looking at this team. Uh, starting off on the offense, Todd Munkin is back as the offensive coordinator. Of course, NFL experience there. I don't know that he's doing exactly what he wants to do, but he is building an offense that fits the personnel that they have uh, best. So a lot of tight ends, uh, running backs that are speedy, shifty, can catch out of the backfield, etc. Very explosive guys. And I do think that they've got some playmakers at wide receiver this year. And of course, that's in Bennett. So you got to keep the offense to where he can actually run it, right? It's nobody accuses Stetson Bennett of being an NFL level quarterback, but he is good at what he does. So long as you keep it easy on him. So don't ask him to do too much and he can be incredibly successful, especially with all the talent that you have around him. Uh, he is back, of course, with a loaded running back and tight end core. Wide receiver, you got uh, Adonai Mitchell. You got uh, Rosemary Sa- uh, Jack Saint, excuse me, Blaylock, et cetera. Like, I think those guys are going to step up a little more this year. Offensive line has the highest rated recruits in the country. You got three of them back with 780-plus snaps. Along with that, you've got another one with 434 snaps, two others with over 100. You have Bowers, Gilbert, Lad McConkey. I mean, you've got names everywhere on this roster and the offense is pretty loaded. I think they, I think the defense may have to lean on the offense a little bit in the early going until the new guys step up and figure out exactly what their roles are, right? That'll move us over to the defense. Uh, new defensive coordinators, of course, because Dan Lanning took the Oregon job. Will Muschamp and Glenn Schumann, both of them were already on staff. They are co-DCs here. Uh, only six players back with 300-plus snaps, but you got plenty of young guys with a ton of talent. I mean, just ridiculous. You do have... Some guys that had some snaps played in 2021, it's very helpful when you get those blowouts, when you can get the young guys in, allow them to make mistakes, allow them to learn on the job, right? Uh, Eight defensive players were drafted off of last year's team. Defensive tackle Jalen Carter is probably going to anchor that line. Nolan Smith going to be a leader at linebacker. And Ringo and Smith will anchor the defensive backs. Tons of talent, but it is all fresh. So it could take a little bit for it to gel. Uh, projected favorites in 12 games. I mean, the key players here, I've got Stetson Bennett. Uh, I mean, we'll see what happens there. I mean, they, I, it wouldn't shock me if somebody else were to come in and maybe take that job because the guys that are behind him were higher-rated recruits than him. Maybe they have more talent, etc. But I think that that's his locker room. 
I think Bennett's the guy in the locker room, so I don't think it's going to be easy to take it away from him. And Kenny McIntosh, I think, is going to be a stud this year. Brock Bowers, of course, was awesome. Jalen Carter. It's a, I could put a thousand names on this list uh, for key players. So, uh, as far as keys to the season here, uh, 15 guys gone into the NFL, five coaches gone, still a lot of talent. How does Georgia handle a hangover? I think that's the question everybody wants to know. Uh, what does the offense look like if the defense is not quite what it was last season? We talk about how efficient, or I did, talked about how efficient that offense was. It's easy to be efficient when you have that defense behind you, when that defense pins them, when the defense gives you the ball on a short field, etc. Right? It's it's different when the defense may not be quite to the level that it was last season. Uh, are they going to be more aggressive on offense? Uh, how does Stetson perform? There's so many questions here. Uh, the schedule still sets up great. I mean, you start off with Oregon. Obviously, there's potential there for, uh, you know, possibly a loss. I don't foresee it. There's a reason why they're favored by 17 here. Uh, but after that, you got Samford at South Carolina. Could be maybe tricky. You got Kent State after that at Missouri, Auburn, Vandy. Uh, all in all, I mean, it's set up pretty well uh, for them to make another run to Atlanta for the SEC championship game and then back to the playoff, even if you are not as good as last season. Now, that being said, projected favorites in all 12 games. There are no games that are projected to be within one score. Uh, the win total sits at 10.5. It's juiced to the over at minus 215. And to win the conference, they are plus 140. To win the division, it is minus 600. I've got them going 11-1. I've got a loss to Tennessee on here. It could be Florida. It could be Mississippi State. That's kind of the stretch run there. If the defense is not quite gelling, one of those offenses could, could, maybe, Get them? Uh, I don't, I mean, would it surprise me if they go 12-0? and 0? Absolutely not. Now, I've, I've got a loss to Tennessee on here because it's tough to go undefeated, especially two years in a row. Um, I mean, we saw it in the SEC championship game last year. Like, Georgia should have dominated Alabama, just that bottom line. Uh, but they couldn't get it done in that, in that big moment. Uh, you know, they got it done in the biggest moment. So, at least they got that redo in the national title game. But, you know, Tennessee... Uh, just fresh off the rivalry against Florida. You know, if Florida gives them a little bit of a game, maybe Tennessee's offense is clicking. Uh, you know, I, I, I see 11-1 and one here. You know, one loss that, that you wouldn't necessarily expect. I mean, maybe it could come in week three at South Carolina. If Spencer Rattler's got that offense humming, yeah, you never know. But I think 11-1 and one is good, and I expect them to be back in the SEC championship game again this coming season uh, and probably in the college football playoff. Just a guess. Just a guess. All right, we'll move on to the Kentucky Wildcats. Now, Mark Stoops has overachieved with this program to a high, high level, and I love what he's doing. I love the way that he's building the roster, et cetera, but the way that he builds this roster uh, doesn't make me think that this is going to be a great season, and I will explain that as we go through. Uh, last year, PPA margin number 31. The offense was number 39 in PPA per drive. Defense, number 31 in PPA per drive. That's uh, predicted points added per drive. It's uh, an, an advanced metric. We'll say that. Kind of includes uh, explosiveness and success rate, et cetera, right? Efficiency. You look at the turnover margin, number 125, uh, that's not good. You look at the explosiveness on offense, the defense allowing number 111 passing success rate, Uh there were, there were some questions. And then, of course, you lose uh, a bunch of guys on the offensive line, et cetera. We'll start off with the offense here. You're losing Liam Cohen, the offensive coordinator. He is the new Rams OC. And you're bringing in Rich Scangranello. Or Scang... Pff, I have messed this up a thousand... I tried to say it a billion times. Rich Scangarello. There we go. Uh, 49ers quarterback coach. Same tree, basically. Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, all that. I think he's going to run a very similar offense. It should work really well for... Um, uh, for Will Levis. The quarterback, of course, is the story here. There's a ton of hype around him, but, you know, last year, numbers not exactly great. They were uh, There's a lot of NFL hype. Only four games that he threw for over 200 yards. That was against three G5 schools in Tennessee last year. Uh, can anybody replace Wondell Robinson? I mean, the production from him last year was absurd. I think he had like a 40% usage rate. Uh, Tavion Robinson, maybe, from Virginia Tech. They got similar builds. Like, maybe that's somebody that could come in and replace him if they try and do the same thing. Um, 
but whew, the offensive line coach is gone. Only two offensive linemen return with over 135 snaps. I do trust Stoops to be able to build a pretty effective offensive line, but who? I mean, that is that's a lot gone from that line. Uh, running back should not be an issue. I wouldn't imagine, even if Chris Rodriguez is out for uh, a couple of games at the start of the season, whatever that situation may end up being. I, I do think they're going to be able to run the ball. They got guys there, so we'll see. We'll see. On the defense, Brad White's still the defensive coordinator. Scheme is probably going to stay the same with a lot of young guys that know it, right? It's all guys that have come up and been developed in that scheme. Defensive line returns four with 200-plus snaps. Nobody over 241, though. So, again, a couple of guys that are wet behind the ears. The linebacking core uh, looks loaded. I mean, you got five players with 200-plus snaps. You got three of them with 486-plus. Definitely, definitely good. Uh, the question here, of course, with that defensive line, et cetera, do we think that they can stay at number 24 in rushing PPA allowed on defense? Because uh, they were great against the run. Uh, secondary brings in two transfers that could play right away, along with three players with 300-plus snaps last year. But they were number 72 in passing PPA allowed. Uh, that wasn't great. This this was not the strongest unit on that side of the ball. I will certainly say that. Uh, you, and you saw it in the Tennessee game. They gave up 45 points there. So, I I look at this, uh, projected favorites in eight games, they've got seven toss-ups. Toss-ups, to me, are games that are decided within one score, uh, or projected to be decided by one score, and that's all the way up to eight points. Uh, you got seven of them on a 12-game schedule. I mean, that's a lot of toss-ups, a lot of coin flips here. Uh, win total sits at seven and a half. It's juiced to the over at minus 190. Uh, you know, like maybe, I don't know, we we look at this a little bit. Uh, the keys to the season... Will Scangarello's offense uh, change much from Cohen's? I don't think so, but we'll see. Uh, who replaces Wandale's production? Now, I brought up uh, Tavion Robinson from Virginia Tech. Maybe. Maybe that's who brings it. I, I, you know, it's tough. Wandale was so good in that offense. Uh, will they continue to produce at a high level on the offensive line with a new OL coach and three new starters? That's going to be a question. Now, Stoops has always developed there. He's always done good, but a lot of questions. A lot of questions right there. And, of course, the key to the season is Will Levis worth all the hype. With the rushing success that they had behind last year's offensive line, they were number six in success rate, by the way. Um, They only had to pass 42% of the time. So it's it's not like they really needed a whole lot done. So, and I've got something talking to me over here in the background. Hopefully you guys can't hear that. But uh, but let's see. Let's, uh, my, my projection here is seven and five. I will say that. <laughs> Seven and five for Kentucky this year. Um, I just whenever they have a really, really big year, this is the kind of program that needs to develop more players as you lose some of the big ones, right? Josh Ali also was a, a huge contributor. Uh, you got Pascal, et cetera, uh, on the defensive side. Like with the offensive line hindered a bit with losing such production at wide receiver. Um, I think the offense is maybe going to take some hits, and I think the defense is going to take some hits. So if you're doing that, uh, it doesn't necessarily set up well, even though the schedule you know, maybe allows you to get to eight wins. So I could see eight wins. Uh, what I've got here right now is a loss to Florida. I've got a loss to South Carolina, loss to Mississippi State, loss to Tennessee and Georgia. Uh, I could see them beating any of those. But you know, I've got wins over Ole Miss on the road. Uh, I've got a win uh, at Missouri. You know, I went over Louisville. Any of those are losable, right? So I think, I think seven and five is reasonable. Um, I don't know if I'm going to bet it. Plus one fifty five for the under. Might have to look at that. Might have to look at that. Um, to win the division, they're ten to one. So there's a lot of hype. But regardless, uh, I do like Kentucky. Uh, I do think that what Stoops is building there is awesome. Uh, again, seven and five. Get Stoops another year extension, so that's definitely good. But uh, but I think there's just a little bit that they lost. Uh, they lost too much coming into the season. So I'll I, at least to me. But you guys can correct me in the comments if you'd like to. All right, moving on from there, the Tennessee Volunteers. Let's see if we can get this thing back on the rails here because it's gone a little crazy. Um, Tennessee Josh Heupel in his first season really really got that fan base excited. Uh, seven and six record, lost in the bowl game, probably should have been a win. Probably, we'll say that. Uh, but regardless, 
Post game win expectancy last year was seven point two three and four point seven seven. So maybe should have been uh, exactly what they were seven to five in the regular season roundabout. Projected SP plus record has them at about eight and a half wins. The win total sits at seven and a half. Juice to the over at minus one sixty. Uh, if you wanted to go under, that's plus one thirty, and that's a pretty good payout. Pretty good payout if they only go seven to five. Um, looking at the numbers from last year, number twenty two offensive PPA per drive. The question is on the defense. Defensive PPA per drive is number 91 in the country. Uh, They could not stop explosive plays. It it was a bit of an issue. But looking at the returning production, they're 73%. That's number 28 in the country. 81% on offense. Defense, uh, you got to replace some guys. So let's start off on the offense. Uh, Offensive coordinator Alex Golesh. uh, This is really Heupel's offense. I mean, bottom line, he's run it since he was at Missouri uh, with some tweaks here and there, of course, as he's learned. But uh, if Hendon Hooker can stay healthy, like Heisman finalist caliber quarterback here, uh, 31 touchdowns, three interceptions last year. I mean, he was just uber efficient. Running back room is loaded. You got Small, Wright, Dixon, et cetera. The wide receiver room, pretty loaded as well. I don't know that they've got that one playmaker that's really going to scare teams, right? I don't think you got that guy right now. Maybe I'm wrong. Like, maybe it's uh, Cedric Tillman. Maybe it's, you know, one of these new guys that's coming in. We'll see. Um, But they do have a lot of upperclassmen who saw a ton of snaps last year. Brew McCoy transferred in. Maybe he's the guy. Maybe he's finally found somewhere that that he'll fit in. Uh, The offensive line has got six back with 400-plus snaps. A lot of depth, a lot of talent at that position there. Uh, Defense coordinator will move over to the defensive side of the ball. Tim Banks, the D, allowed 33.6 points per game in SEC play last year. And bottom line... This is the side of the ball that's going to determine whether or not the Volunteers are an SEC East threat. If they are legit contenders for a championship, they have to be better on this side of the ball, period. Uh, The secondary was better than the front seven last year. Uh, The defense was number 68 passing PPA allowed, but they were number 91 rushing PPA allowed. Uh, The secondary does lose the safety Jackson, quarterback Taylor. Good news is there's 12 players back with 250-plus snaps, so that's definitely good. Uh, you got Georgia Tech transfer uh, cornerback Walker that comes in. He could start immediately. There are freshmen that could play key roles on defense, uh, especially on that defensive line. So look for a lot of that there. Uh, they're projected favorites in eight games. They have got five toss-ups on the schedule. Again, for me, a toss-up, any game that is projected to be within one score all the way up to eight points. I told you the win total sits at 7.5, and, and it's juiced uh, to the over at minus 160. The keys to the season here. Fans need to not set their expectations too high on this because last year uh, he comes in, Hypo comes in, and resurrects what was basically a dead program, right? Uh, team does look pretty good. They are not on the same talent level as the elites just yet. They are close, very close. And if they keep recruiting like gangbusters like they've been doing, then yes, obviously that's going to be good things. But keep the expectation level normal. Don't expect them to go undefeated. I'll just say that. Uh, the offense exciting, but I will say it's – I'm not going to – I put easy to break down on here. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy. I'll just say there are defenses, if they have the right pieces, that will be able to know exactly what Tennessee is doing, and they'll be able to stop it. There were several of them that were able to stop it last year. Uh, it can always keep Tennessee in games with just a single play, right? That offense is super exciting. So – We'll see exactly what a year of film means for all the teams on their schedule this year because uh, they they got a lot of them that have already seen this offense now. And I think these defensive coordinators are going to be really prepped for it this year. Defense was number 113 in scoring opportunities last year. Uh, They gave up 80 drives inside their own 40-yard line. I mean, that is just a monster number. Uh, Number 97 in points per scoring opportunity. So... When they did get down there, they didn't get a lot of stops anyway. Uh, Getting stops is going to be the key to contending this year. Uh, I've got them at 9-3. and I really like this team. I like the the roster strength. I like the fact they've got so many guys back on offense. I like the way the schedule sets up. Uh, At Pitt early, like definitely get them early before that offense has a chance to really figure out what they're doing because I don't know that their offense will be able to keep up with Tennessee at this point. Not with Signetti. Not with what they're doing. Um, After that, you know, you got Florida coming in in week four. Yeah, Florida's already going to have two pretty tough schedule, uh, two tough games at that point. I think this is 
uh, a prime spot for Tennessee to get that win. Then they come off a bye. They go down to Baton Rouge. I don't know that I necessarily like LSU a whole lot. I think they, I think Tennessee could be 5-0 and before they go to Alabama or before Alabama comes into Knoxville. Um, I don't, you know, I look at this. I've got a loss to Kentucky. I mean, I feel like they could win that one. I feel like they could maybe beat South Carolina. Like maybe the, I see 9-3 and three here. I don't really know who it's going to be to. I've got a loss at South Carolina. I've got a loss to Kentucky, and I've got a loss to Alabama. I've got Tennessee beating Georgia. I think nine and three would be just huge. Uh, if it's a loss to Georgia and Alabama, and then just one more loss elsewhere, I think that's a monster year, a fantastic season, and definitely something to build on as the recruiting continues. Now, uh, I hope the volunteer fans would be happy with that for sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I would take the over at minus one sixty. I think it's a small price to pay for sure. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, our gambling picks, our store, the gear we use, and more. Subscribe to us on YouTube to get not only the full shows, but individual segments along with other goodies as well. We're over 5,600 subscribers right now, and our goal by the end of football season is 7,500. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. You can visit winningcureseverything.com slash store and see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, the Missouri Tigers are next up on the docket here. Uh, last year, made it to a bowl game. Uh, the numbers maybe showed that they shouldn't have, but regardless, we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Eli Drinkwitz, 6-7 and seven last year, lost the bowl game to Army. Uh, were 4-9 and nine against the spread. They Their post-game win expectancy said that they were 4.4 wins and 7.6 losses in the regular season, and yet they went 6-6. Six and six. Uh, returning production is number 88 in the country, 57%, and the roster strength ain't great. Uh, defensive side looks pretty good. Offense, uh, questionable, for sure. Questionable there. Uh, this team was number 97 in PPA margin last year, number 103 in net points per drive. Uh, I mean, that's how they made it to a bowl game. I am just shocked, just shocked. Uh, Eli, of course, is the offensive coordinator. We'll start on the offensive side of the ball. The quarterback, Brady Cook, uh, in non-garbage time, he was 0 of 1 on passes 20-plus yards down the field. He only threw once down the field, really. Uh, 11 of 11 on uh, 0 to 9-yard passes and 5 of 5 behind the line of scrimmage. He was efficient, but we got to see more. We got to see if he's the real deal, right? Wide receiver room is loaded here. Uh, you got Burden. You got Lovett, Cooper, um, Dove, et cetera. The offensive line is missing a center now because of uh, what happened with the Buffalo transfer. Uh, he was denied. Uh, immediate eligibility, which is bananas. I mean, they're letting everybody else play. Like, what's the problem here? But regardless, uh, running back is going to be interesting without Tyler Beatty. Uh, I don't, I don't like the strength on the roster here. Uh, number eighty-three roster strength for the offense, at, at least according to the guys over at CFB Winning Edge. Uh, there's just a lot of questions on this side of the ball. Defensive coordinator. We got a third new one in three years. Blake Baker comes in. He was LSU's linebacker coach after Steve Wilkes, of course, moved back to the NFL. Uh, Blake likes to coach an aggressive defense. Very attacking, for sure. Defensive end, Jeff Coat is a monster. McGuire's good. They added five transfers for a ton of depth at defensive line. Uh, Drink has used the portal as effectively as anybody in college football, in my opinion. Linebacker, you got Nicholson and Bailey transfer. Tyron and Tyrone Hopper. Uh, from North Carolina and Clemson, respectively, of course. Uh, the secondary loaded with safeties. Cornerback's going to be kind of interesting. I think they've got the talent there to be pretty good there. Uh, again, I think this defense is is pretty strong. Pretty strong defense. This team is a projected favorite in only four games. They have five toss-ups. Again, toss-ups, any game that is projected to be within eight points. So, a one-score game. Win total sits at five and a half. It's used to the under at minus 120. Uh, you know... Like it's just a tough number, tough number. Uh, you got to figure out quarterback first. I mean, that's the the very beginning here. Uh, you do return four starters on that offensive line. Center's got to be figured out after Polgar, of course, was ruled ineligible. 
Uh, third new D.C. in three years. Like, what is that going to mean for a really talented defense? You know, Ryan Walters and Steve Wilkes each left for different jobs. They couldn't stop the run or the pass last year. Uh, can they find some consistency with these transfers? Uh, on offense, who replaces Tyler Beatty? Like, he had 1,604 yards rushing, 14 touchdowns, and he had 13 more receptions than the next closest receiver. Like, he was an everything guy. Who replaces that kind of production? Uh, I've got him at 4-8. and eight. Like, I don't feel good about this because I, I do like Eli Drinkwitz. I like what he's doing. But there's key positions that I think there's a lot more questions than people are really asking here. Um, my only wins on the season, I've got Louisiana Tech, Abilene Christian, Vanderbilt, and New Mexico State. Like, that's, that's the only wins that I've got right now because I don't like the way that the schedule sets up. Um, you got Kentucky at home. You got Georgia at home. And you've got Arkansas at home. Like, I think I think all of those are losses. I think the better team is the road team there. Uh, and then the ones that, you know, maybe you might have a shot in, like at Auburn, that one's on the road. It's just a tough place to play. Uh, you get at Florida, and that's the week after Georgia. Uh, that's a that's a body blow game. I, I just, I don't like uh, the way that the schedule sets up. And I think there's a lot of questions about this team. And I hate that because I, I enjoy when Missouri does well. But... Whew, there are questions all around this bunch. Uh, moving on from there, the South Carolina Gamecocks. You want to talk about a team that has got some hype right now. South Carolina, uh, this bunch here, let me scroll up here. Uh, Shane Beamer, I mean, just outperformed everybody's expectations last year. I think their win total was three and a half last year. Uh, they went seven and six with a bowl win over North Carolina. Not bad. You got you got wins in the regular season over Auburn and Florida. I don't think anybody saw that happening. But regardless, here we are, uh, seven and six last year. They've got seventy percent returning production. That's number forty in the country. Uh, they've got the number ten roster strength in the country per CFB Winning Edge. Number five on offense. Now, if you watched that offense last year, you would have never believed that this is the tenth, or excuse me, the fifth highest rated offense as far as roster strength in the country. But that's what they were able to do in the transfer portal. Uh, offensive PPA per drive last year was number 92. Defense was number 50. So the defense ruled the day last year. Offense, I think, will be it this year. We will talk about that side of the ball here. Uh, Marcus Satterfield, in second year, he was Mar uh, Matt Rule's offense coordinator at Temple. Then he spent some time in the NFL, et cetera. No idea what to expect here. Uh, all the prior numbers make no sense at all when you look at who they've got here. Quarterback Spencer Rattler, massive upgrade. News out of camp is he has been flinging it, man. Uh, brought in two talented transfer running backs to pair along with Marshawn Lloyd. The tight end, Jaheim Bell, was an absolute beast last year. He's back along with the wide receiver, Josh Van. You bring in the wide receivers, Rucker and Wells from Arkansas State and James Madison. You got the tight end, Stogner, coming in from Oklahoma to pair along with Spencer Rattler. The offensive line is loaded. Uh, can the six transfers gel? Like, that's the question, really. And you would have to imagine that they will at some point. Can they do it early? Because that early schedule, Georgia State, they were they were on fire to end last season. Along with that, at Arkansas, again, team that was on fire at the end of last season. Another team that's really, really good, and you're going into a buzzsaw in week two there. Georgia in week three. Like, these are difficult games at the very beginning of the season. Even if you lose those, you start to gel once you get towards the uh, the middle of the year. You get done with South Carolina State, and then you have to go play at Kentucky. You get a bye week, and then you get Texas a and &M. I mean, it's a brutal, brutal schedule. Uh, but I got a lot of love here. Uh, I'll say that. We'll move over to the defensive side of the ball. Clayton White, in his second year, he led great defenses for Western Kentucky uh, and was really the reason why uh, uh, Tyson Helton, I think that's his name, Tyson Summers, I can't remember, Tyson Helton. Whoever it is that's at Western Kentucky right now, I swear to God I know this name. Uh he, he basically saved his job because Clayton White is the one that led that first defense that was really, really good for him. So, uh, defense number 97 in PPA per rush, but they were number 28 in PPA per pass. So, that secondary was awesome. They were pretty good at getting stops. They were number 32 in points per scoring opportunity. The back seven returns a lot, so obviously that's good because that was the strongest side of the ball last year. Uh, the only two defensive tracker uh, transfers were a cornerback and defensive end, but they can both play immediately. Defensive line has got six guys that had 135-plus snaps back. Only Zach Pickens was the starter here. Um, it's it, This is questionable. 
right? Uh, the defense, you got some questions here. If the offense can gel, maybe take a little bit of pressure off that defense, I think you can expect some really, really good things here. Now, uh, they're projected favorites in only five games. They have six toss-ups. Again, toss-ups are one possession projected finals. Uh, the win total sits at six and a half. The over is juiced at plus 110, the under minus 140. So it is juiced more to the under here. Um, but man, I'm not going to lie. I have bought in on this hype. I have bought in on the Gamecocks. Uh, I think culture matters in college football. We saw it with Arkansas last year, right? I think culture matters. There will be some of these games that are pretty close that I think that they're going to win just because their team likes to be around each other. They gel consistently, etc. cetera. Uh, the keys to the season here, talent all over the offense, but can it gel? Can it be cohesive? Spencer Rattler has some serious weapons at running back, tight end, wide receiver, and the offensive line looks loaded too. Uh, that's the question. Can the offense gel? Can the defense stop the run? That's the other question. I just brought up that PPA per rush number, number 97 last year. Secondary, not a question here. Uh, we're good last year. They've got serious talent, but you need the defensive line and linebackers to improve in year two. Beamer, really building something here. Like, really building something. If the transfer talent can come together, this could seriously be a team to look out for. I've got them going 8-4. and four. I've got them going 8-4. and four. The losses, uh, Texas A&M, Georgia, at Arkansas, and at Clemson. Those are the four losses. I think they beat everybody else on the schedule. We will see. Obviously, this is going out on a limb, um, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Hopefully, you guys are as well, uh, because I think I think what Shane Beamer is doing here is pretty good. He has figured out that you don't necessarily have to be able to recruit the kids out of high school. You can go and get the kids that maybe are really talented but don't like their situations elsewhere in college football. Beamer is the perfect guy for that, and the culture he's building in Columbia is phenomenal for sure. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter, at Winning Cures, or you can follow the guys at GaryWCE and at Chris B. Giannini, or you can also follow us on Facebook. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show, and from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now... Back to the show. All right, we continue on with the Florida Gators and Billy Napier in his first year at the helm in Gainesville. Uh, I'm excited to see what he ends up doing because this is not going to look like what Florida fans are used to. That is for sure. Went 6-7 and last year, just a complete debacle under Dan Mullen. I mean, just ridiculous. The fact that they went 6-6 and in the regular season, their post-game win expectancy was over eight wins last year, 8.24 and 3.76. They should have been much better than they ended up being. Uh, This team looked like they did not have a lot of fight left once they got down the home stretch, for sure. Uh, Looking at, you know, returning production, number 85 in the country, that's not all that important, especially when you've got a new coaching staff coming in. Um, But I look at roster strength, and that's where I get a little confused. Number 18 in roster strength over at CFB Winning Edge. Uh, Number 26 on offense, that's not great, but obviously defense, number 7. For them to be that strong on defense and maybe having a deficiency on the defensive line, I'm curious. I'm curious what this is going to look like and what they're going to try and like how creative can they get with that, right? We'll start off with the offense here. Um, Offense last year, I mean, PPA per drive number 43, Rushing success rate number 42. Their passing success rate was number 16. Like it, I, you, I can't really figure out a lot. I do know this. Their turnover margin was pitiful. The penalties per game, awful. Number 115 in turnovers. Number uh, 119 as far as penalties per game. So that probably put a lot into it. Um, 
Uh, Rob Sale is the offensive coordinator here. He, he was with the New York Giants, but he led some ferocious offenses at Louisiana for Napier before that. So he knows exactly what Napier wants to do. And these guys are not afraid to get ugly, right? To go and just the basic things that you need to be successful on offense. Good offensive linemen, good running backs, and a scheme to get them out into uh, some free space, right? Something along those lines will work regardless of what level of football you are at. Uh, the offensive line does return six guys with 253-plus snaps that bring in right guard Torrance from Louisiana, and he was all sunbelt last year. I mean, just awesome. The running back room looks stocked. There's no proven playmaker other than maybe the Louisiana transfer Johnson. Wide receiver, you got talent with Shorter and Henderson. You brought in Arizona State transfer Ricky Pearson, um, or Pearsall, excuse me. Uh, the offense boils down to the quarterback, Anthony Richardson. Like, Heisman potential, possibly, I think that this could be the perfect offense for him because I don't think that they're going to expect him to throw the ball a ton. I think that in Napier's offense, Richardson will get to show off his legs a lot, and we saw him last year, and he was awesome, absolutely awesome. So we'll see uh, what he's got between his ears for sure going into this season. Defensive coordinators, of course, moving to that side of the ball, Patrick Tony and Sean Spencer. Uh, they were number 104 in takeaways per game last year. Now, normally you can blame that on aggressiveness or the lack thereof, but I don't think that that was the situation with Todd Grantham last year. Um, you know, it, it, Louisiana, by the way, was number 24 in that metric, so it, Louisiana found ways to get turnovers, for sure. Defense was not a talent problem for Florida last year. It was, it was scheme, it was culture issues under Grantham that I would imagine... You find a way to clear out this year, uh, but we shall see. Again, brand new coaching staff. We're going to see how many guys that are currently on the roster still want to be on the roster at the end of the year, for sure. Plenty of defensive ends, plenty of defensive tackles with experience, um, but maybe a little thin as far as the depth goes. You know, maybe I don't know. I'm I'm very curious about this because they've they've got some key guys there, but I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. I don't think the defensive line is going to be great. I think if they end up with some some injuries, they like just maybe one injury, they could really be in some trouble there. Uh, the linebackers should be good, of course, with uh, Brenton Cox, Ventral Miller, etc. The secondary going to be lights out, even even without Elam. Um, let's see, I, I, how quickly can they figure out this playbook? I think that these guys make it easy enough, especially early on, uh, that they should be able to play early. Like, I, I've got wins in the first three games for Florida here uh, over Utah and Kentucky. Like, getting those games in Gainesville, massive, massive spot. Uh, they're projected favorites in nine games this year. Six of them are toss-ups, not, not of the favorites, but just overall. Six out of the 12 games are toss-ups where they're either uh, favored or an underdog by one score, eight points, uh, whether it's less than eight points, et cetera. Hopefully I explained that right to you guys. Uh, keys to the season here. Year one is just setting the tone. So I, I don't know what the expectations really should be. Uh, he's, you're building a culture from basically nothing because there was no culture left after Mullen. Uh, it was just at the bottom of the barrel. And even the bottom of the barrel was a bowl team for Florida. So exactly what are the expectations when you are rebuilding from nothing? And the nothing is a bowl. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, are, are fans going to be okay with a different product? Because Billy Napier is not the slinging around the ball yard kind of guy. He is not a Spurrier protege. Uh, he is much more in the vein of Saban and Dabo. And we'll see. We'll see. Uh, what he's done at Louisiana, now maybe with different talent, he opens up the playbook. He opens up and does something different. But obviously, we'll have to wait and see. If Richardson hits in this offense, there's really not a ceiling for him. Uh he was phenomenal last year in the limited amount that we got to see him. Napier and Sales' offense can be simple enough for his raw talent to just take over. And again, I'm not comparing him to Cam Newton, but we have seen Cam Newton being an example. When you allow a player's raw athletic ability to just take over a game, you take all the thinking out of it. You just make it easy. Like one decision, two decisions, like however many options, et cetera, just let him go make plays he can be dynamite in that situation. Defense allowed 26.8 points per game last year. That was number 73 in the country. 
and they lose stud cornerback Elam and the defensive end Carter. Uh, can the defensive line stay healthy because depth is thin? Uh, the secondary does have talent here. What are we going to get from this defense? Like, they are talented. It was not a talent issue. It was a culture issue. Can they turn it over before the season even starts? I doubt it. I think it's something that will be fixed throughout the season. But regardless, there we go. Uh, I've got them at 7-5. and five. I've got uh, I've got Florida at 7-5. and five. I think that stretch where they played Georgia at Texas A&M and then South Carolina uh, after the bye week, I think that's pretty brutal. Now, I do have a loss to Florida State here. That one seems very coin flippish to me right now. I, you know, I like what Norvell is doing at Florida State, but I'm also a pretty big Billy Napier fan. So we will see how that one goes. Um, you know, at seven and five, right on the number. The the projected uh, win total here, not projected, excuse me. The win total is set at seven, juice to the over at minus one thirty. Uh, when you're reestablishing culture, like there's going to be some bumps and bruises along the way. This is very similar to what I expect from Brian Kelly at LSU. I I expect big big things in the future once they get this season established, right? You you get the foundation built, and then from there you build on top of it. And I think that that's what we're going to see from Florida. Now, finally, a team that we don't want to spend too much time on, but we will for the sake of it. The Vanderbilt Commodores, Clark Lee's second season. Uh, there are things to be helpful for. There, I mean, there are, there really but you look at last year, and uh, let me change that back over again. Uh, Clark Lee like went two and ten last year, and while there's not a lot of hope as far as the offense goes, I do expect the defense to improve in year two under him. Uh, they brought in Nick Howell, the defense coordinator. Uh, he was the DC at Virginia and at BYU under Bronco Mendenhall. Um, the post game win expectancy last year was point nine three, so less than one win, and they were able to get two. So that's obviously a step in the right direction. That's that's good. They're number 27 in returning production in the country, uh, number 25 on defense, number 40 on offense. Uh, we're going to start off on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, it just the numbers, the numbers on both sides are pitiful. Uh, but they were, you know, at least somewhat uh, disciplined, I guess you could say, number 33 in penalties per game. Uh, then we're number 85 in turnover margin, so probably need to fix that. But let's start off with the offense. The offense coordinator, Joey Lynch, is his first year as OC. Uh, he was the passing game coordinator and the quarterback's coach, and he he started calling the plays towards the end of the season last year. Uh, he was the OC at Colorado State and at Ball State before, so he's got experience in this role. Everything was bad last year. Everything. All of it was bad. Uh at quarterback, like, is it Wright or is it Seals? Uh, I think Wright really gave him a spark towards the end of last year. Uh, Seals did start both of their wins. Offensive line is probably going to be a mess. You got four players with 391 plus snaps, but no experience behind them at all. Uh, Brammer from North Texas may be their best offensive lineman, uh, and him coming in, of course, as a, an immediate transfer. Uh, running back Davis, wide receiver Shepard are both good. Like, if you can actually have time to throw the ball. If you have a little bit of protection, anything from that offensive line, you got some decent skill position guys that can make some plays. So maybe that's something to build on here. Going over to the defensive side, I told you about Nick Howell. He was the DC at Virginia and BYU under Bronco. Uh, biggest weakness, pass rush. They only had nine sacks in 2021. They didn't really address it. Like they got one guy, like one recruit that came in that's known to be an edge rusher. But he's a freshman. Like it's still got some work to do with him. You got to get creative in getting pressure this year, and I, I expect that Clark Lee will. I mean, obviously, defensive background uh, was linebackers coach at Wake Forest and at uh, Notre Dame under uh, Mike Oko. So, like he he learned from one of the best. Uh, the linebacker Patterson coming over from Clemson, uh, the cornerback Lucian from UConn. Vandy could start as many as ten players that actually started in 2021. So, experience should equal improvement. We think, I guess. I mean. You can't really be worse than they were last year. Uh, number 119 in PPA per drive. I mean, it just... Whew. Uh, um, they're projected favorites in two games. And they've got two games on the schedule that are projected to be toss-ups or games that are projected to be within one score. I I do like this team a little bit. Uh, let's talk about keys to the season, and then I'll, I'll go through the schedule here. Uh, likely going to see improvement on defense in year two, but how much? Uh, almost anything's better than what they did last year. They were number 120 in overall success rate allowed last year. Uh, that's bottom bottom 11. I mean, just, 
Whew, I mean, just awful. Uh, can either Wright or Seals improve to give the offense a chance? 12 touchdowns, 13 interceptions combined last year. Um, Got to fix that. Got to fix that. Long rebuilding job under Lee. The NIL and the portal make it even more difficult. Uh, they're going to lose their best players to big programs. They can't really restock easily because of the academics required. Uh, this is just a long rebuild. A really long rebuild here. But I think that they're going to stick with Clark Lee and give him time to actually get this thing figured out because, I mean, those last few years under Derek Mason, when everything started changing around college football, it was tough. Very, very tough. The win total is at 2.5. To go over is plus 100. To go under is minus 130. Uh, don't worry about the division or the conference odds. Don't don't even. Don't even. 250 to 1. I mean, just, yeah. Uh, I've got them at 3 and 9. I think they're going to beat Hawaii. I think they're going to beat Elon. And I think they're going to beat uh, Northern Illinois on the road. And then after that, I don't see another win on the schedule. I mean, it is tough. Uh, at 3 and 1 to open. And then, yeah, 0 and 8 the rest of the way. Just brutal. Uh, the loss to Wake, like, they'll probably lose at home to Wake Forest. Um, after Northern Illinois, you got to play at Alabama. Then you got a bye week, Ole Miss at Georgia, at Missouri, bye week, South Carolina at Kentucky, Florida, Tennessee. That ain't an easy one on there. there. There's not even a toss up on there. I mean, it is, it's tough. Even Missouri, because that game's on the road, like at Missouri should be, you know, over a two touchdown favorite there at 17, 18 points, somewhere close to three touchdowns. It's tough, but I'm going to go over the two and a half because uh, I, I believe in what Clark Lee is doing, and uh, and I think that they can get that win at Northern Illinois. Now, if you really want to be smart with it, as far as gambling goes, uh, maybe you just fill them out and see if they can win those first two games, and then and then maybe you just bet on Vanderbilt at Northern Illinois rather than just having your money tied up forever, right? But regardless, there's ways to uh, to get around it. All right, that is going to wrap up. Today's show, you guys have been fantastic, as always. Uh, these The previews have been a lot of fun. I've spent way too much time on these, uh, but I will continue to do so next year because I really enjoy this, and hopefully you, could, uh, you guys do as well. Uh, we're not going to take too much more of your time. Subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the podcast, etc. And with that said, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully, 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 all of you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.